I want to ask you a question. If you were committed to somebody for years, at what point in your relationship would you decide to leave? What would cause you to call it quits after five years? A decade? Four decades? I bet I know what most of you said. Cheating. If your partner was unfaithful, right? Easy choice. What if it wasn't that easy? I'm not saying you wouldn't leave out of love because being cheated on hurts like hell. But what if your partner couldn't help but be sexual? What if a medical condition that your significant other could not control made them cheat on you? Would you break your vows of in sickness and health for better or for worse if your partner was truly just sick? If being unfaithful was a disease, if sex was an addiction, what if your partner was being treated for this addiction through talk therapy, medication, and even rehab, but they still found themselves being unfaithful? Would it be the same then? Would you be able to support your significant other? Your spouse? Your best friend? Maybe even the parent to your children? How would you feel if you were with a sex addict? In today's episode, I'll be talking about sex addiction and the impact that can have on a person's life, but also how it plays a part in the lives of couples. I'm Jess Faulkner, and this is Just Jess. Today's episode is called Episode 14, Addicted to Love. Time for some updates. Health-wise, my numbers have gone down. After climbing over 250,000 points, my numbers have gone down by 30,000 points. So that's that's good. I think the Jacafee has been working out for me. Maybe the second dose of the Jacafee has been working out better for me. Um, I definitely feel like it has less side effects than the hydroxyurea did. I am having a hard time with some heart flutters. Um, as you may know, I suffer from tachycardia, which means my heart beats too quick sometimes. My heart beats too fast sometimes, except for sometimes is all the time for me. So I'm on propranolol, a beta blocker to help regulate my heartbeat. I also have mild flutters with irregular rhythms. So sometimes my heart goes into an irregular rhythm and it flutters. I don't know. I can't even. Oh, my gosh. You know how there's the saying, you know, I've got butterflies in my stomach. Imagine having <laughs> imagine having one butterfly in your chest that weighs 20 pounds and it flutters its wings like three times. It just goes dot, dot, dot. Really hard, really heavy. That's what it feels like. It feels like a very hard and heavy, deliberate flutter. I'm still dealing with leg pain. I don't know. I don't really know what to do about that besides keep taking the gabapentin but the gabapentin is just a little bit much i am i just have to take so much of it to maintain you know not having the pain in my legs and it's just too it's just too much for me i don't want to take that much gabapentin and i don't like the side effects that it it has i would say health wise it's mid right now like who knows so as far as health goes, I think it's kind of good and bad, or maybe not bad, but just good in what can be expected. Good that the numbers have gone down, my numbers have gone down, you know, but bad that I'm having these heart flutters a lot more and this really bad leg pain, just this excruciating leg pain to where it's, I just don't want to walk. Sometimes I just want to collapse. Mantis, I don't know. I don't know if I gave you this update yet. I'm pretty excited about it. But the mantis have hatched. The mantis have hatched. 
Um, they've been slowly just kind of eating each other, which is cool. I have one big mantee. He just kind of hangs out in habitat all by himself, but he's the biggest mantee I have. And I just feed him the fruit flies when I can. And it's pretty great. And I really love it. I'm super excited. I try to take him out and like let him crawl on me and get used to me and stuff like that. He doesn't seem to be into it. That's okay. That's all right. But as far as mantis ha uh, go, I have maybe five left. Maybe five left. Probably three. Probably about three. And the one in the habitat by himself is the biggest one. He's my big fella. So I think he probably did a lot of manti eating, mantis eating. Huh. Josh and I sat down and worked on a life plan. We worked on two years and five years. Uh, we talked about ideas of what will happen, where we want to go when he retires, which will be very soon. So for two years for me, I health wise, I just like to still be alive. To be honest, I would just that's my that's my goal for two and five years. Be alive. I would like to be debt free in two years, which I think is possible. I'd love to be debt free in two years. Um, I would love to be in a place that we're going to be for a while, you know. I would love to be in a place that we're going to be for a while to rent a home because I never want to buy a home. It seems like an effing nightmare. But Josh really wants to buy a home, so I'll let him do all that. He can buy a house. <laughs> That'll be his thing. I want to be healthier. You know, I'm, I've am i been going to the gym. I've been doing yoga. I've been doing all this stuff and trying to be healthier. And I would like to be... I'd like to definitely be more fit. My ideas of what will happen, I think we'll move. We'll probably move somewhere. I don't know if we'll stay on the East Coast. I would like to go back to Virginia or to go to Maryland. I think that would be cool. I loved Virginia. You know, I loved Virginia. I have friends in Virginia. I would love to see my friend Karen again. Um, it's beautiful there. There's, it's the land of opportunity. You know what I mean? Being DC, being close by. I don't think I would live in Montclair again, to be honest, because that's kind of been ruined for me. But I would love to live somewhere near Montclair, maybe. We shall see. I would like to be working full time again. I mean, I I talk about this like I'm not sick. Like I don't like I don't like I don't have cancer, you know. But I would like to think that with this Jacofee working on lowering my numbers and maybe getting my numbers in a normal range, maybe getting on some medication to help my um energy levels, things like that. I feel like maybe, you know, I could manage this and maybe I could get a full-time job. Maybe I could go back to work full-time and I don't know, either go back to cooking full-time or maybe I'll just podcast. I'm okay with, I would be okay with just podcasting because I really enjoy it. So two things you should know about me. One, I love to cook. Two, I love to talk. I would like to live somewhere that's not too cold for too long, like Colorado. Colorado is winter for like eight months out of the year. Like it's still snowing in Colorado. Um, but I don't want to live anywhere too hot, like here in, in South Carolina, where it gets like 114 degrees in the summer and you just melt. So maybe a bit more north. Like I said, Virginia. Virginia sounds wonderful to me. I'd like to do Virginia. Mental health wise, I am going through a lot. I'm going through a lot. I'm very stressed, um, but I'm excited to see what the future holds. And I'm very happy to have my therapist, Leanne. So, so happy for her. She just, she's a very big help for me in my life right now. And, you know, I just can't encourage you guys enough to look into talk therapy if you're having a hard time. Talk therapy has saved my life, literally. Literally has saved me from dying. 
I've been making new friends. I think I've told you about this. I've been making new friends. I've been using friend apps, which sounds really lame, and I guess it kind of is, but I don't care. I've been using friend apps to make friends, and I think it's going pretty well. Um, I'm supposed to be hanging out with some friends, hopefully, maybe soon. I've been hanging out with a nurse named Monica. She's been pretty cool. I've been having a good time with her. We've been going to places together and doing things and we've been just hanging out and doing things and having a good time my trips i have trips unfortunately my oklahoma city trip got canceled so i'm super bummed right now so if you hear it in my voice (laughs) if you hear that i'm super sad it's because my trip to oklahoma city got canceled which was like my, which was like a mini vacay, but that's okay because I have my trip to New York City coming up in like 21 days or something like that. Um, and I'm super excited. I am going to redo this New York City trip and have a proper New York City trip. And I've already planned out where, I, you know, I've already got the place where I'm staying. I've already planned out where I'm going to get coffee in the morning, where I'm going to get bagels or pastries, um, what I'm going to do, where I'm going to eat. Really, (laughs) really, my plans consist of eating (laughs) Um, and just, you know, just enjoying myself, just having a good time. This is my Mother's Day present and my birthday present combined. And I'm very excited about it. I'm going to see if I can get some people to come hang out with me in New York City. I don't know. We'll see. I'm only there for two days, two nights, so three days. So, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But I'm very excited. Sex addiction is not an easy topic to cover. And it's not necessarily because it's hard for me personally as somebody who struggles with hypersexuality, but because there's just a general lack of information regarding sex addiction due to lack of reporting. Here's what we do know. When somebody struggles with sex addiction, it typically manifests as a lack of control over sexual impulses, thoughts, and urges. While it's not abnormal to think about sex frequently, sex addiction happens when these behaviors become compulsive, excessive, and negatively impact your life. Discerning between someone with a high sex drive and sex addiction can be challenging. Given how taboo sex can be in some cultures or religious communities, people may mistake normal sexual urges for addiction, especially when taught sex or masturbation is inherently harmful. There is a difference between libido or a high sex drive and people with sex addiction. Many people disregard the serious consequences of sex addiction or imply that all people are sex addicts because it's pleasurable. However, sex addicts often experience many negative emotions like embarrassment or frustration due to compulsions. People with sex addiction may also put themselves in dangerous situations to fulfill their urges, engaging in prostitution, or risking exposure to sexually transmitted diseases. This usually comes with having unprotected sex or sex in unsafe environments. Understanding sex addiction and normal sexual desire is important as some people have different libido levels or sex drive. A person's sex drive can vary depending on hormone levels, exercise, and genetic factors. While an individual with high libido may look sex obsessed from the outside, this doesn't necessarily indicate that they're suffering from a sex addiction. Some common symptoms of sex addiction include obsessive sexual fantasies, feeling out of control when thinking about sex, spending excessive time on sex and masturbation feeling shame, depression, and anxiety about your sexual urges, missing school, work, or social functions for sexual activity, excessive masturbation, engaging in risky or inappropriate behavior, such as public sex, unprotected sex, hiring a sex worker, cheating on one's partner to have more sex, and in extreme cases, committing criminal sex offenses, While some sexual offenders may be sex addicts, there is no evidence that sexual addiction can lead someone to commit sexual offenses. People generally view sex as a pleasurable activity, and for a good reason. 
During sex, the brain releases dopamine, a neurotransmitter responsible for feeling pleasure. When someone achieves an orgasm through sex or masturbation, their body releases a hormone called endorphins, which relieves pain and reduces stress. With so many feel-good chemicals flooding the brain during sexual experiences, some people may begin to crave more of that feeling. Behavioral addiction forms when these cravings become uncontrollable compulsions that interfere with daily life. Much like drug addiction, behavioral addiction like sex addiction can run in families. Therefore, knowing any history of addiction in your family can be an excellent tool for being more aware of potentially addictive activities. Individuals with mental illnesses with compulsive tendencies or impulse behaviors such as borderline personality disorder or bipolar mania can be at more risk of developing sex addiction. Even some data suggests watching pornography at a young age can contribute to sex addiction later in life. Like, for example, in a study for Cambridge University, out of over 900 sex addicts, 90% of men and 77% of women reported that watching porn was a significant factor in their sex addiction. Of course, there are some harmful consequences of sex addiction. Like most behavioral addictions, sex addictions can consume someone's life. Their education, job, or relationships may suffer as the addict dedicates more time and thought to sex than anything else. It's also common for those with sex addiction to have comorbidities with mental illnesses like depression, anxiety, and mood disorders. The most apparent physical risks associated with sex addiction are sexually transmitted diseases like HIV and AIDS, genital herpes, and hepatitis B, all incurable. For sex addicts who regularly sleep with new people or engage in one-night stands, the risk of injury or sexual assault also increases. Sex addiction can also impact the addict mentality, causing problems like lowered self-esteem, guilt, or shame. So how is sex addiction diagnosed? Because people with sex addiction often experience embarrassment and guilt about their compulsions, people just fail to seek for help. Between their feelings of inner shame and society's taboos surrounding sex, many sex addicts and loved ones suffer in silence. There's no singular test for sex addiction. Still, a licensed mental health care professional can assess you or a loved one determine if you meet the criteria for hypersexuality or sex addiction. Your doctor will typically do a psychiatric evaluation to establish if you have a sex addiction and if any comorbidities like bipolar disorder or disorders that lack impulse control. Once diagnosed, your doctor can walk you through the treatment options and what might work best. And fortunately, there are treatments for sex addiction, like a licensed mental health care provider can guide you through the process of diagnosis and treatment. Psychiatry is often the primary treatment for dealing with sex addiction. Uh, Therapists tailor treatment for sex addiction to individuals, and this approach usually emphasizes group therapy or one-on-one psychotherapy. The most common type of therapy is cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, which focuses on helping you discover unhealthy thought patterns and establishing more beneficial ones. And if you're in a relationship, couples therapy can also be beneficial, especially if your sex addiction impacts your partner. This type of therapy will allow all parties to voice their feelings and encourage the creation of a supportive strategy for future success and recovery. There are some medications that help with sex addiction, like antidepressants and mood stabilizers. Now, there is a debate about sex addiction, as it doesn't actually have official criteria for diagnosis in the DSM-5, or the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, the 5th edition. However, many Americans are diagnosed and treated for the condition every day. Since there is a large lack of national studies on the prevalence of sex addiction, Uh, There are smaller studies that indicate between 3 and 6% of the general adult population in the United States of America suffer from sex addiction. When it comes to sex addiction by gender, more research is done on males exhibiting compulsive sexual behavior than women. Therefore, the current data is skewed more towards men than women. So, according to research from University of Minnesota... 10.3% of American men and 7% of American women experience distress or impairment from difficulty in controlling their sexual desires, urges, and behaviors. 
One study found that male sex addicts participants tended to engage in voyeurism and anonymous sex, while female sex addicts, on the other hand, preferred exhibitionism, trading for sex, pain exchange sex, and fantasy sex. Unfortunately, there is no broad or definite data on sex addiction by race. In fact, most research on sex addiction to date seems to be focused more on white sex addicts than any other race. A 2012 study from UCLA found that in a representative sample of people in sex addiction treatment, 92% were white. Such studies raise real issues with current sex addiction research and why white people are disproportionately represented in sex addiction treatment. Many researchers aim to conduct studies with more diverse participants, hoping they can better understand the relationship between race and sex addiction. But anyone of any age can develop sex addiction, given the right circumstances and risk factors. However, research has revealed patterns of why many individuals develop signs of sex addiction or compulsive sexual behavior. While in-depth data by age does not exist, some studies have shed light on the relationship between age and sex addiction. Signs of sex addiction can start quite early in life or quite late, affecting adolescents and older adults alike. According to research from UCLA, 54% of sex addiction patients begin experiencing sexual fantasies, sexual urges, and sexual behaviors before age 18. Unfortunately, most addicts don't seek professional help until about age 37. Sex addiction has high rates of comorbidity with mental health disorders and other addictions. For example, porn addiction is one of the most common co-occurring addictions found among sex addicts or hypersexual disorder. Mental disorders commonly found to co-occur with sex addiction include depression, anxiety, mood disorders like bipolar disorder, impulse control disorders, OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder, ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, personality disorders. University research found the following disorders and types of addiction often found co-occurring with sex addiction. 38% of sex addicts had eating disorders. 26% of sex addicts had compulsive spending. 43% of sex addicts had drug addiction. 5% of sex addicts had uncontrollable gambling. For behavioral addictions like sex addiction, treatment options often include therapy like cognitive behavioral therapy, group therapy, and support groups or a 12-step program like Sex Addicts Anonymous. The success of these treatments depend on many factors, such as willingness to address compulsive behaviors, co-occurring disorders or substance abuse issues, and support from loved ones. Research published in the journal Sex Addiction and Compulsivity studied 88 married couples over seven years where one partner had a sex addiction. The study revealed the following statistics for sex addiction treatment and recovery. 9% of sex addicts had been through an inpatient program for compulsive sexual activity. 79% of married couples reported they were attending meetings for sex addicts. 91% of sex addicts and their partners had seen or were seeing a professional counselor or therapist. The average time in recovery from sex addiction was 3.4 years, ranging from 2 months to 14 years. 38% had less than 2 years in recovery. 28% had at least 2 years, but less than 5 years in recovery. And 34% had at least 5 years of recovery. If you feel like you struggle with sex addiction or hypersexuality, you can try using SAMHSA's online treatment locator or call 1-877-726-4727 or 1-877-726-HELP. I believe I am over-sexualized for different reasons, especially given the research that I've been doing on hypersexuality, sex addiction, and comorbidities between sex addiction and hypersexuality, and what I am diagnosed with. Here's what I think. I believe that my exposure to sexual content starting at the age of four really was the kickoff point for everything. Then being sexually abused starting at the age of four probably did not help things from there. So by the time I was four, I was, over, I was already overly sexualized. I also suffer from addiction. 
I have addictive personality. I am an alcoholic and I'm a drug addict. And that's just how that is. But I can honestly say that my addictions are under control. I don't use drugs and I drink responsibly most times. Can't say all the time. Sometimes I drink too much, but that doesn't happen very much and I am human. I'm also bipolar. I'm diagnosed with rapid cycling bipolar type one. And that is, has a comorbidity with hypersexuality and sex addiction. I think growing up, I also had poor examples of sexuality. You know, I saw my mom being over-sexualized by my dad. And then my mom's lack of confidence in herself. But also knowing that my mom had to sexualize herself to please my dad. That's kind of what I thought being a woman was. So when I was first married... I definitely did anything that I was told to do by my husband. You wanted breakfast at six o'clock in the morning. I made breakfast at six o'clock in the morning while wearing a pinup dress and heels, full face of makeup. I brought you breakfast in bed, six o'clock in the morning. You want your dinner served at 5 p.m. sharp, a hot meal on the table at 5 p.m. I'm going to do it in a pinup dress and high heels with full makeup. Your dinner, you're going to have a hot, delicious dinner at the table at five o'clock. I will do the laundry. I will clean the house. I will take care of the kids. I will be this over sexualized identity for you because apparently that's what I believe was the role of a wife. That's just what I thought was the role of life. I was also diagnosed with histrionic personality disorder at the age of 19. Let me tell you a bit about histrionic personality disorder, as I feel like it belongs on this episode, Addicted to Love. Histrionic personality disorder is one of a group of conditions called cluster B or dramatic personality disorders. People with these disorders have intense, unstable emotions and distorted self-images. For people with histrionic personality disorder, or HPD, their self-esteem depends on the approval of others and does not arise from a feeling of true self-worth. They have an overwhelming desire to be noticed and often behave dramatically or inappropriately to get attention. The word histrionic means dramatic or theatrical. This disorder is more common in women and people assigned female at birth, but researchers think that that might reflect a bias in how the condition is diagnosed. It usually is evident by adolescence or early adulthood. In many cases, people with histrionic personality disorder have good social skills, but they tend to use these skills to manipulate others so they can be the center of attention. If you have this condition, you might be uncomfortable unless you're the center of attention. Act seductively or dress provocatively or both. You may shift emotions rapidly. Act very dramatically as though performing before an audience with exaggerated emotions and expressions, yet appear to lack sincerity. Be overly concerned with physical appearance. Constantly seek reassurance or approval. Be gullible and easily influenced by others. Be excessively sensitive to criticism or disapproval. Have a low tolerance for frustration and be easily bored by routine, like often beginning projects without finishing them or skipping from one event to another not thinking before acting, making rash decisions, be self-centered and rarely show concern for others, have a hard time maintaining relationships, often seeming fake or shallow in dealing with others, or threaten or attempt suicide to get attention. The exact cause of histrionic personality disorder is not known, but many health professionals believe that both learned and inherited things play a role. For example, the tendency for histrionic personality disorder to run in families suggests that a genetic cause might exist. But the child of a parent with this disorder might simply be repeating behaviors they learned at home. Other things that experts think might play a role is not being criticized or punished enough as a child, or getting positive feedback from parents only when you show certain behaviors that they approve of. Inconsistent, unpredictable attention from parents. Confusion about what behaviors will get approval from parents. Your temperament, psychological state, and the way you learn to cope with stress while growing up all can play in the role in developing a personality disorder. Personality disorders are tough to recognize. 
And if you have one, you may not think there's anything wrong with you. Often someone with histrionic personality disorder seeks help because their condition has caused problems in their life, such as relationship issues leading to depression or anxiety. If you show signs of histrionic personality disorder, your doctor may do a complete medical and psychiatric history. The doctors might do a physical exam and laboratory tests, such as neuroimaging studies or blood tests, to make sure a physical illness is not causing your symptoms. If the doctor finds no physical ailment, they may refer the person to a psychiatrist, psychologist, or other licensed behavioral health professionals who may use specifically designed interviews or assessment tools to evaluate a person for a personality disorder. The mental health professional will ask you questions about your work history, your relationships, impulse control. If you have histrionic personality disorder, you might not be aware of your behaviors, so family members or other close people to you could be asked for their help for input. The American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders spells out a criteria for histrionic personality disorder diagnosis. The most recent version of the handbook, published in 2013, is also called the DSM-5. If you have HPD, you'll show five or more of these behaviors on a regular basis. You're uncomfortable unless you're the center of attention. You behave seductively or provocatively. Your emotions are shallow and shift easily. You use your appearance to draw attention. Your speech is vague. You think your relationships are closer than they really are. You're easily influenced by others. And your emotions are dramatic or exaggerated. Remember, according to the DSM-5, you need to show five or more of these behaviors on a regular basis. Histrionic personality disorder can affect your social, professional, or romantic relationships and how you react to losses or failures. You're also at higher risk than the general population for depression and substance abuse. Extreme attention-seeking can include threats of suicide. If you have histrionic personality disorder, you're more likely to have certain other psychological conditions. These include somatic system disorder. When you have this, you get very focused on a physical symptom you have and get overly upset about it. You may not realize that the symptom itself is not serious, and you might have unnecessary medical tests and procedures trying to treat it. Conversion disorders are also called functional neurological symptom disorders. When you have this, your mental health condition causes physical symptoms such as seizures, paralysis, loss of sight, or loss of hearing. The symptoms are real, but they are caused by your mental health disorder disrupting your brain and central nervous system. I was diagnosed with HPD when I was 19, and then it fit to a T. It was exactly who I was. Of course, I'm 33 now, and things are much different, and I'm a very different person than who I used to be. My priorities have definitely shifted. I'm highly medicated and in talk therapy, so I feel like I'm well-managed, but I do know that occasionally these symptoms of HPD and sex addiction do pop out. If you hear this podcast and feel like any of this applies to you, please seek out the help of a mental health professional. You can also contact SAMHSA's online treatment locator or call 1-877-726-HELP. That's 1-877-726-4727. This has been a rough topic for me. This is a rough, this is a hard topic for me to talk about as it's something that greatly affects me. I have OCD, I obsess, I am hypersexual because of what has happened to me in the past, the things that I've been through, the the exposure to sexual content at a young age, the comorbidities I have with being bipolar, with the histrionic personality disorder, with addiction. This is just another addiction for me. And I'm trying my best to manage my way through it, but it is hard. And I'm trying to do what I know to do, and that's talk to people about it. But I'm not always met with understanding. Sometimes it's 
Sometimes it's judgment because people just don't understand what this means. For me, this isn't something that I want or something that I have chosen. It's not on a list of mental health disorders or addictions that I wish that I had. But these are the cards that I've been dealt, and I'm trying to do the best I can with what I have. And I hope understanding comes from that, that this is, that I'm in anguish because of all of this. It's not easy. It's very hard. And again, I'm just trying to do the best I can. I hope you're trying to do the best you can too. That's all that we can really do. That's what I tell my kids. I tell my kids a couple things. Practice makes better, not perfect. So in our house, we say practice makes better. Another one being, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And I'm trying again and again to do the best I can. And that's what we tell the kids. Just do the best you can. That's the best you can do. That's all you can do. That's the most that we hope for is somebody do the best they can. I think that's what we're all trying to do, to be honest. I think that we're all just trying to live our life the best that we can and do the best that we can. So I hope the best for you. Take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. I love you. This podcast was produced by Joshua Faulkner. Information from this podcast comes from WebMD and other sources online. For more information, visit www.leftoverslimited.com.